I'd like to um, first invite all of you to stay after the talk to um, talk casually with today's speaker at a little reception. We have several exciting events coming up on April 17th. We'll be holding our Indigenous Feminism uh, Symposium um, for which you can still register, right? Yes. Yeah. On April 18th, we're co-sponsoring with the English Department a fantastic panel on Allen Ginsberg. And um, in the following days, we have a conference co-sponsored with philosophy on Aristotle. And on April 26th, we have our end of the year reception to which all of you are invited to celebrate our many accomplishments over the year. You can find out more about these events by consulting our flyers on the little sand inside the door and by um, faithfully, fanatically, religiously following us on social media. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to be introducing Rahim Kurwa. Um, he, he is an assistant professor in the departments of criminology, law, and justice, and sociology. He teaches courses on race, class, gender, and the law, poverty law, criminology, law, and justice in American cities, race and ethnicity in American life, and social stratification. He's received his PhD in sociology from UCLA in 2018, and he's been a recipient of numerous grants and fellowships for his work, including support from the Russell Sage Foundation, the American Bar Foundation, and the Bloom Initiative for Global and Regional Poverty Studies. He is author of numerous articles on race, class, poverty, and the law in prominent journals in his field, his, his article co-authored with Susila Gurusami, a treasured institute alum, I might add, is on the racial and gendered politics of homebreaking and poverty governance. This was recently published by Feminist Formations and received honorable mention for a distinguished article from the American Sociological Association of Sex and Gender section. His article on opposing and policing racial integration received an award and honorable mention from the Society for the Study of Social Problems and the ASA, respectively. I should add that in addition to the work from which he's presenting today, Kerwa has been working on a brilliant Sun Village digital history exhibit, which received support from our Digital Humanities Initiative. It's an amazing project that I hope everyone can check out when they get a chance. Um, and I personally have been learning so much from Rahim's work, even before he got a fellowship, when you were just telling me about your work, it's been eye-opening and mind-expanding. So it's been really wonderful learning about your work over the course of this year. Please join me, join me in welcoming Rahim Kurwa to discuss how policing became property and how people are fighting back. Oh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Katie, for all everything that you do to make uh, this run. And especially thank you, Mark. Uh, I know I think a lot of us know you have somewhere more important to be today. Um, the Distinguished Scholar Award at NYC. Um, and I wonder if maybe we can just give you a round of applause. So um, I'm going to start this talk at sort of at the end of it. Um, at a press conference in 2015, where one of the members of a group called the Community Action Week, uh, both by Jesse Smith, uh, explains the significance of their victory to the press. And it says, no longer will there be un unannounced compliance checks. No longer will seven or 10 sheriff's deputies show up at a Section 8 residence, armed and ready to invade the home. That is now finished, right? This was some of the most important um, elements of the political victory that uh, his group had achieved that he wanted to put it sort of on center stage to the public. And it's a sort of interesting moment in that um, these are very important things to, to have accomplished, but at the same time, they're things that many people in the United States take uh, quite a bit for granted. It's not the usual experience to have this kind of home raiding happen uh, to your home or to even be aware that something like this could happen to you. Um, and to sort of try to explain the significance of, of the victory that he's describing here, I'd like to kind of walk back through uh, a bit of history in the place where this happened um, and in the broader sort of uh, legal context of this case. And for me, this all occurs in the long shadow of the year 1882. Um, in 1882, um, I'm going to talk about two sort of main things that occurred. 
And the first of these was um, a court case in uh, Kansas called Falloon versus Schilling, 1882. And uh, this is James Falloon suing his neighbor, Adam Schilling. Um, and in Hiawatha, Kansas at the time, um, what's happening in this moment is that Black residents of the Deep South are leaving and are coming up to places like Kansas and farther out of the Deep South. Uh, at the sort of start of the Great Migration, this is during you know the, the rise of the Jim Crow era, and um, you can read about the Kansas nature of this history in the book Exodusters. Um, but Adam Schilling decides that he's going to rent some of his uh, land to a black family. He's building an addition to his property. He's going to rent it to a black family. And James Falloon is outraged and searching for ways to stop Schilling from doing this. Right? And this is sort of before many of the legal technologies of British segregation that we're familiar with in history books sort of comes to fore, and Falloon is unable to sort of interpersonally persuade Shilling. And so he goes to court and he tries um, to use nuisance property law to stop Shilling from doing this. And um, I hope none of you are familiar with nuisance property law. Um, and if you are so unfortunate to have any idea what that is, um, I apologize, but nuisance property law essentially operates such that if you and I are neighbors and um, I create some large amounts of pollution or noise or something else like this that crosses over into your property and disrupts your ability to enjoy your property, uh, you could sort of call the police or ask the court to force me to stop. Right? And this is sort of at the heart of many neighbor disputes. Um, and normally it, these, these cases center around things like pollution uh, or noise or things like this. But what James Falloon was doing was turning blackness into nuisance, right? And um, this has been theorized and explained very well in the cases that are cited at the bottom of this, of this slide here. Um, and what Falloon was asking for and what the several dozen race nuisance cases that come during this era are trying to get are two sets of powers, preemption and eviction, right? In Falloon's case, he wants to preempt Adam Schilling from uh, renting to a black family. But in other race nuisance cases, um, the plaintiffs are asking to evict a black family who is next, living next door um, through this nuisance property argument. Right? And what's sort of interesting about these cases is that Falloon loses uh, in most of the race nuisance cases filed between the late 1800s and early 1900s tend to lose. And the reason why is that the courts see this as a contest between two sets of like property interests, and they sort of take a hands-off approach to that. Um, however, the argument that I want to make to you is that the things that James Bloom had asked for then, preemption and eviction, are things that have now been sort of won by you know, his sort of uh, descendants in a way. Right? These are powers that actually now exist for American property owners today. The second major event that happens in 1882 that contextualizes this case is the story of Charles Graves, um, who was born in Kentucky uh, at the end of the Civil War. And um, his father dies in the war, um, and, but he's left some money. And he uh, gets on the Southern Pacific Railroad in the late 1800s, and sorry, in, yeah, the late 1800s, um, and gets off in the Antelope Valley in a town called Rosamond at the northern end of this place, the Antelope Valley, Rosamond. Oh, and Graves was intending to be a cattle rancher. He was very skilled. Um, he was a very skilled horse horseman. Um, but he strikes gold in the Antelope Valley uh, in the mines, and um, you know, sort of, the changes his life trajectory. He marries a woman named Cordia Anita Roberts. They, she's a school teacher, and they start the first um, public integrated uh, school in the Antelope Valley. He goes on to become the postmaster. He and his family have a long and sort of prominent history. Um, as much of an impact as Graves made, the public history of the Antelope Valley tends to forget the, uh, his existence and, and sort of his time, and thinks of the Antelope Valley as a predominantly white place whose sort of uh, more modern origin is in, is in the mid 1900s. Um, and well, I'll just show you now where this place, the Antelope Valley, is. Um, this is a map of Los Angeles, and uh, the Antelope Valley is in the red circle in the northern. Uh, portion of Los Angeles County. It's still within the county's borders. Um, and if you were to drive from downtown or the Hollywood sign or the beach uh, to the Antelope Valley, it would take you about an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half or maybe even two hours. Um, you have to cross what's called the Angeles National Forest, 
in order to get there. And the Antelope Valley is sort of unique in LA because it's actually at the bottom end of the Mojave Desert. So it has a desert sort of landscape. Uh, the Joshua tree is a very prominent there, very different from much of the rest. This is roughly what it would have looked like uh, in this sort of artist sketch of the Antelope Valley uh, during Charles Graves' time. Um, and when Graves arrived there, he was part of um, a broader trend of Black placemaking in this sort of periphery of Los Angeles, right? From quite early on, Los Angeles was a place of extreme white supremacy, especially in the context of housing, right? A very strong KKK presence in the early 1900s um, and very early sort of adopter of racially restrictive covenants and other mechanisms of segregation and racial oppression. Right? And so many Black communities pop up at the margins of LA or in its periphery. Uh, and the Angela Valley is just one of them. And um, the place that's really of central concern there is a, is a town called Sun Village, um, which I'll have more to say about in a little bit. But these two stories, these 1882 stories of Charles Graves and James Falloon, sort of wind their way through American history, but intersect again in the Antelope Valley in the 2000s. Um, and I'll try to show you how that process leads out. So let me now turn to this place, um, Sun Village. Um, it has a, a really remarkable history. I've tried to um, put some of that history into this digital exhibit, which you can uh, go to follow this link at the bottom of the page here. Um, but it, it is an all black town in the Antelope Valley. Um, and its history comes from a very specific uh, confluence of, of political and economic conditions in Los Angeles uh, more broadly. Um, Early on, the Antelope Valley was sort of scheduled or planned to be a sort of agricultural community. You can see here this, this pamphlet advertising the land describes it as the breadbasket for the future of Los Angeles at 5 million people. So that was, that was the economy plan for the Antelope Valley, but it's, it, um, it's squashed quite quickly. In fact, there's a note left by somebody on this pamphlet that the land ended up being sold um, to build the Palmdale Airport uh, just a few years later. And the story behind this is told in a book by Roger Watching called Fortress California. And what happens is essentially the following. Um, during World War II, much of the military construction, aerospace industrial construction on the West Coast is centered in San Francisco and Los Angeles, right? And the War Department, while it was still called that, uh, looked at that with some trepidation. It was sort of uh, dangerous to put all this construction in a few places. It could easily be you know, blown up or something and then that would really diminish the war making effort. And so the War Department tells Los Angeles, we're going to disperse these contracts more broadly around the West Coast, right? which is a real economic danger to the city. Um, it would lose these investment dollars to you know, Utah or Arizona or San Diego or you name it. And so they come up with a solution, which is to, which is to turn the desert in the Antelope Valley into this new frontier of military aerospace investment and development. It's pretty easy to build a bunch of you know, warehouses and factories and plane landing strips and so on on this relatively underdeveloped land. And that's just what they do, right? And in fact, for a little bit of time, the Antelope Valley becomes sort of nationally famous. Chuck Yeager breaks the sound barrier there. I mean, that's, that's sort of big national news. Um, this idea of the sort of space cowboy, right? this uh, new cool version of the American West comes to fore during this, during this era. And some of that is recaptured in the, in the 1980s movie, uh, The Right Stuff. Um, but as this sort of uh, idyllic sort of utopia is being created, um, there's, some, there, there's some considerations to this, right? Number one, um, although the Antelope Valley had a much more diverse population prior to this, um, the, the massive construction of Lancaster and Palmdale in these years is largely occurring sort of almost start, right? So these communities are able to build essentially purely perfectly segregated communities with, with, with great ease, right? And because so much of the employment um, in these households was in the military aerospace industry, much of this community was a middle-class community, right? They had sort of recreated a more perfect version of Los Angeles than Los Angeles itself. Right? But of course, others had to fill the rest of those gaps in the economy, and Black workers were being pulled into the end of that to work as janitors at you know, Lockheed or Boeing, um, or to work at the grocery store or the filling station and so on. And that's very difficult because to drive from Los Angeles to the Antelope Valley, not all the roads or highways are paved. 
Um, they don't have street lights, right? It's, this is not a very easy proposition. And so soon, Black families begin to try to find ways to settle down in the Animal Valley. Of course, they're excluded from living in Manchester and Palmdale. And so they built Sun Village here on the eastern edge of the Animal Valley, just across from this dry riverbed uh, in this, this map. Uh, and soon the, the construction of Sun Village becomes, you know, part of uh, news stories that gets reported in, in the LA press and so on. And much of it sort of originates with Stan Melvin and Ray Grubb, who so actually came from Chicago to the Antelope Valley um, and decided to sort of create the Sun Village uh, Land Corporation as a sort of um, um, unique movement, right? He sort of argues that the Antelope Valley is never going to accept Black families on equal terms and that they need to acquire and build their own housing in order to sort of be able to assert the lives that they, they want to live. Um, and so he's really the progenitor of parceling out this land and beginning to develop. Um, Sun Village has a number of really important community institutions, uh, the church, the women's club, this is one of the main heads of that, uh, Jesse Carroll, and the South Antelope Valley NAACP, which really, um, in, all, in, in their different ways, lead a very transformative set of efforts to build long-lasting community institutions and to challenge uh, racial segregation, um, employment discrimination, and educational segregation in the Antelope Valley. And they're very successful. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but again, you could you could uh, visit the sort of not quite finished, but almost there uh, digital exhibit about that. Um, but let me say a little bit more about the NAACP and its work in the Antelope Valley. Um, it was founded by Patrick Patton and Lois Patton, uh, a really remarkable couple. Patrick Patton has to move up there because he works in the aerospace industry. Um, this is him at work during, during the war. Um, and they found the NAACP chapter there and uh, they, they campaign on education, employment, and housing. Right? And eventually they become the first family to break the wall of racial segregation in the Antelope Valley, moving to Palmdale in 1962. And usually, um, you know, I'm the kind of person who doesn't really put much stock into those kinds of individual moments. But I think in this case, it was a very, it was like the pinprick that burst the balloon. And the entire edifice of how the Antelope Valley understood itself as a sort of middle-class white utopia was exploded by just this one instance of movement because it presaged, um, you know, much, much more to come. Um, and, but this is happening during the civil rights movement and just shortly before the passage of the Fair Housing Act, which take away a number of tools that these communities would have used to maintain the racial population. And so what happens next is a sort of long-term evolution towards policing as a new mechanism of reasserting those racial um, For those, some of you might be familiar with some of the work on this, um, particularly Daniel Martinez Sosang's really wonderful book, Racial Propositions. Um, and Gene Slater's new work uh, as well in California. But these, these, these books really tell the story of the California Real Estate Association, which uh, in these years launches a campaign around the forgotten man in the, in the civil rights era, that being the uh, property owner uh, or white property owner. And they try to pass a property owner's bill of rights during this era. Um, and they organize their, their arguments around this basic idea in our judgment Owning and disposing of property in a free society is a human right. Disposing of property, by that they mean being allowed to racially discriminate in who you sell or rent your property to. And they use the word human right uh, in, in very specific terms. Right? This is during the civil rights movement, and they're trying to put property rights on a platform above civil rights as human rights. They're joined by the soon-to-be governor of the state of California, Ronald Reagan, who says, there's no such thing as property rights in the connection used by some. They're only human rights. And some of those human rights are the rights involving Again, putting property rights above civil rights in this discourse. And soon Reagan becomes president and sets in motion a series of policies that begin to actually make this a bit of a reality. Um, and so you begin to see this play out first in federal law and then in local law. At the federal level, at the end of uh, Reagan's second term, he passes the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, which contains in it a provision that, that allows local public housing authorities, like the Chicago Housing Authority, to evict their tenants if their tenants are convicted of drug or criminal offenses. Okay? Um, 
And this sort of is like the foot in the door for a set of policies that will dramatically expand these things and have come to be called the one strike eviction rules in public house. In 1996, Reagan's successor, uh, Bill Clinton, passes the Housing Opportunity Extension Act, which actually diminishes housing opportunities for these people. Um, but this act dramatically expands the one strike eviction rules, right? Instead of simply being allowed to evict tenants, the rules now say that local housing authorities must are mandated to evict their tenants. Um, instead of saying that the tenants must have been convicted of some kind of offense, it says even if they're suspected or accused of an offense, and instead of it being the tenants, right, or the leaseholders themselves, it's now anybody who's even associated with each, each home, right? So you could have a grandma in public housing who's caretaker who comes, you know, once a month to, you know, check on how she's doing. If the caretaker is caught down the street with a little bit of marijuana on them, grandma can be evicted. And this happens all around the country. It's challenged in the courts through the Rucker uh, versus Hyde case in 2002. And the Supreme Court blesses the eviction class you know, these grandmas right, all around the country. In signing this bill, Bill Clinton issues a prayer where he says, if you break the law, you no longer have a home in public housing. Right? One strike and you're out. That should be the law everywhere in America, right? And his prayers sort of come true in the form of local law that actually fulfills the requests, the, the, the goals of James Fulham in his race nuisance case back in 1882. The crime-free housing ordinances that are passed in cities all around the country do the work of preemption that Fulham had once asked for. They allow or mandate, depending on what city you're in, uh, that landlords either can or must deny rents, uh, rental leases to applicants who have a mark on their criminal background check. And of course, given the racially disproportionate nature of the criminal legal system in this country, that burden falls disproportionately on Black renters. That's the preemption part of Fulham's claim. And then you have nuisance housing ordinances, which uh, essentially allow people to pick up the phone and call and file complaints about their neighbors in ways that will eventually push their landlords to evict them. The eviction portion of Falloon's original uh, nuisance property argument. Right? So in this sort of um, dystopian way, we're sort of behind where we had been uh, back in that in that moment. Um, now I want to show you a little bit of how this plays out in a day-to-day -day basis. And there is much more to say about that um, in terms of interview data and so on, but I'm going to kind of minimize that a little bit so I can show you the social movement that uh, has resisted it. But I'll try to show you a little bit of a thumbnail sketch. Right? And that begins in the sort of more recent history of the Antelope Valley as its economy goes into free fall at the end of the 1980s and the early 90s. Right? The Cold War had basically ended. And the the aerospace investment that was propping up this region was drying up relatively quickly. Within a decade, the Ample Valley lost about 40,000 aerospace jobs, which is one job for every six residents of the Ample Valley. Uh, not employees, but residents in Ample Valley. This is an economic catastrophe that really they cannot uh, return from. Right? They try to get on the, uh, the sort of bandwagon of you know, the uh, the boom of, of prison construction in California at this time, uh, which is, you know, of course, so well documented in uh, Ruth Gilmore's Golden Gulag. But even through building a, a local prison, they're only able to replace a few thousand of these jobs. There's nothing they can find that will, that will make up for this. Except for the following. Rather than having used their housing construction to support the military aerospace economy, they flip this dynamic, right? And they use all of this you know, now vacant housing as a source of an economy in and of itself. They become the new housing supplier for Los Angeles. As people are being squeezed out of LA proper, right, through gentrification, displacement, you name it, they turn to the Ample Valley and say, this is somewhere where I can afford to purchase a single kind of home, as long as I'm willing to sort of commute back down to LA for work. And so this becomes their new sort of lifeline, sort of raison d'etre. And in this way, the Valley's relationship to LA becomes inverted, where they had once looked down upon LA. Right? The, con the sort of shorthand is that LA is down below. Um, now they're really dependent on LA uh, in, a very, in a very clear sense. And at the same time, um, in the Antelope Valley and in Los Angeles and in California more broadly, uh, these places are going through a significant demographic change. Right? Um, just based on how people report their identities in the US Census, the population identifying as white alone in the US census in, in Lancaster, one of the key cities there, 
drops from about 85 down to you know, just about 25% in about 40 years. Okay. At the same time, the black population grows dramatically in the Antelope Valley, and the population of people identifying as Latino or Hispanic in the census rises significantly as well. Okay. And this is not just a race and ethnicity story, it's also an, an economy or class story. On the right here, you'll see a map of where Section 8 housing choice vouchers are located in Los Angeles. The Section 8 voucher is sort of the contemporary replacement for much of the American public housing that was uh, destroyed um, in the late 80s and 90s and 2000s. And the voucher program essentially works like a coupon. You get this coupon and you can go find a landlord who's willing to rent to you, and that landlord will receive a fair market rental reimbursement from the federal government. So landlords in the Antelope Valley seeing their economy sort of collapse around them, find the voucher to be a very attractive option. And what happens is you end up with two clusters of voucher usage, one in South Central, the weakest housing market in LA at the time, and the other being in the Antelope Valley, the most peripheral area of LA County. And the Valley's response to all of this change was to turn to policing as its mechanism of preventing these changes. Right? And it sort of coalesces in, in the mind's eye, right? All of this change around the figure of the Section 8 housing choice voucher tent. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time to play these videos. You can just find them on YouTube. There's no, uh, they're not hiding the ball here. Um, but the city council in their meetings is very clear. The mayor says it's time to go to war against the Section 8 renting community. Uh, he says, make no mistake, the city wants to limit the number of Section 8 units that are placed in this community. Um, you know, in these conversations, in these in these city council meetings, he says, you know, we so now we know he's confirming to the city manager. Now we know the goal of the city is to get rid of half of the Section Eight population. Right? And finally, at the end of these conversations, they just they settle on this goal right, to make it easy to file nuisance lawsuits with the assistance of the city against Section Eight housing. Right? And you can see here the parallels to James Falloon's attempt to use nuisance lawsuits to rid himself, right, to, to rid his neighborhood of potential Black renters. And so this is sort of what unfolds. The cities of Lancaster and Palmdale pay investigators to target Section 8 uh, voucher renters. These are them receiving an award for their eviction work. Um, <laughs> they pass a crime-free housing ordinance. They're one of many cities in the state of California that pass these crime-free housing ordinances. And the majority of those that pass these ordinances did so in the aftermath of Black movement to those regions. Right? Um, they pass a nuisance ordinance, which aims are not very well hidden. Right? You see this community taking down the home of this uh, sort of darkened figure here in the center of this home. The nuisance ordinance explains how to make the phone calls and get your neighbors evicted. Um, it is essentially distributed around these communities um, to sort of give you instructions. Right? Um, and the housing authority sort of branch, uh, administrative branch in the Antelope Valley um, employs a fraud hotline that you can call and also file complaints to. Finally, they partner with LA County Sheriff's Department to um, have sheriff's deputies get paid overtime to accompany these investigations as they have. Um, now this system is quite complicated, but it has a number of key strengths that I wanna sort of highlight. Um, one, because there are many agencies involved, many of them can trigger these investigations, right? There are a number of different, you know, um, sort of employees who can start with these investigations. There's a number of different phone numbers you can call to trigger one. Um, there's a lot of different ways for these problems to start, right? The fact that there's a lot of agencies involved also means that these agencies can pull information from various government sources uh, about tenants, right? So you would often have the housing authority bring the sheriff's department with them, and the sheriff's department would look into someone's, you know, um, welfare records or, you know, Department of uh, Family and Child Services records in a way that the housing authority couldn't look. Um, and this would, again, create more ways to kind of, uh, police these tenants, right? Local residents were enfolded into the work of making complaints, right? Dramatically expanding the sort of, quote unquote, police force, if you will, right? You have neighbors keeping an eye on uh, what they assume to be Section 8 properties in their neighborhood, and then filing those complaints. Um, there's virtually no democratic accountability, right? The closest proximate democratic institutions to where this is happening are the ones that came up with this plan, right? So your outrage or outcries about it is simply confirmation that it's working, right? The city council was completely on board with this. 
But the other democratic institutions are all headquartered in downtown Los Angeles, right? These are county institutions that are anchored at the seat of county government, right? A mile, you know, an hour and a half drive, right? How to figure that out or, or really to petition your government is almost impossible. And the tenants who are subject to this policing are very atomized. The voucher system is a very privatized, right? So tenants don't know each other and can't kind of connect to advocate for their own shared interests. Um, so now how this, how this plays out right? um, and how to make this policing and property uh, I'll just briefly show you a few quotes from some tenants. Um, this is a man named Jim who says, when we got RX Paris, that's the mayor of Lancaster in office, that was a change of time. Um, excuse the language here. He says he stood up to the Mongols. He stands up for what he believes. He's against Section 8 himself. And bottom line is he's got the sheriff's department working with him where I got a deputy sh sheriff on speed dial on my phone. I call him up every time I've got a problem on the block. I don't put up with no crap. Okay. Jim is empowered by these policing powers and takes them very seriously and participates in them. Okay. Alicia, um, a tenant that I spoke to, explains what this looks like on the other side. She says they stare at right, our neighbors. They call the police for anything. Not on me, but my neighbors across the street. They call the police on them, like if they park their car in front of the mailbox, they call the police. It's ridiculous. They have too many cars in the driveway, they call the police. That ain't your business, right? She's pointing out that you can make these complaints based on really ticky tacky things that, that are not really substantive in nature, but just making them is part of this process of terrorizing families and potentially triggering investigations and evictions. Finally, Jim, I wouldn't even say confesses as much as perhaps brags. He says, I got the section of people thrown out because I was calling code enforcement every day. Every day, code enforcement was over at that section eight house. This again is quite on the record, on the books, right? But how this policing system is working. Um, so let me zoom out now and show you the sort of scale of what was going on, right? In, in just one year, the worst year on, at least on record, as far as I can tell, the cities of Lancaster and Palmdale were home to 3,532 voucher households, which contain, you know, somewhere between two and three residents, right, per household. Um, and over one sixth of all voucher tenants in Los Angeles. That year, the Housing Authority received 446 calls to the straw hotline about voucher tenants at the Antelope Valley, which is more than the number of complaints made about voucher tenants in all of the rest of Los Angeles County combined. Right? An extraordinarily disproportionate activity going on. The authority conducted 414 investigations and proposed terminations in 195 cases. Again, more than the number of terminations proposed in the rest of LA County. And these are recorded on these. Uh, sheets that were turned over as part of litigation. Um, to give you a sense of how disproportionate this, the, the, what was happening in the Valley was, in the rest of LA County, about one in every 100 voucher tenants had their lease terminated in a given year. In Palmdale, that number was one in every 12, and in Lancaster, one in every 22. Uh, each time someone would call and make one of these complaints, if it triggered an investigation, it would look like this. These are some photos taken by the LA Times accompanying uh, the investigators, and they will bring LA County Sheriff's deputies with them, who you can see peering over someone's fence, and you'll notice that they have their guns drawn. Again, as they enter a room, knowing that they're being followed by journalists, um, they're entering a home that likely has less people in, in, the, in the home than there are police officers there, and the uh, sort of modal person on the voucher program in, in this place would be a black mother raising children. They are bringing, they're going in there with their weapons drawn. Right? They are, you know, this is an extraordinarily dangerous situation for anyone who is the target of this. And what I think you see here, thinking about Jim and thinking about the kind of uh, power that someone like Jim can, can wield, right, is to notice that to engage in policing is to occupy a different social position relative to the position you once may have had before you could do this, right? In fact, simply to be able to engage in policing, even if you're not doing it, is to occupy a different social position, right? This gradient is being stretched sort of as we speak. And of course, this also comes with degrading the social position of those without access to this policing or those who are essentially the targets of this policing, okay? So um, when Lois and Patrick Patton kind of shrunk the racial hierarchies of the Antelope Valley by geographically moving into Palmdale, right? geographically shrinking that distance, um, this sort of imbuing people with this social status of being able to police their neighbors is restretching that, that racial hierarchy again in a new way. Um, and these themes, I think, 
um, echo, you know, through through much of American history and, and sort of legal and official scholarship. I'm reminded of perhaps the most famous passage in W.B. Du Bois's book, The Construction of America, where he's talking about the components of what he calls the public and psychological wage associated with whiteness in the Reconstruction era. And he names all these different sort of benefits associated with whiteness, but among them, he says the police were drawn from the ranks of white civilians. Here, I think what you're seeing is an inversion of that, whereby white citizens are drawn policing power into their ranks, right? or essentially non-black citizens are drawing these policing powers into their own, their own ranks. Right? But I think it still results in the same kind of a dynamic. Um, Casey Park in her recent work on history wars and property law um, sort of points out the, dele the sort of state delegation nature of this, right? that the government is delegating the power to produce and maintain racial hierarchy into private hands. Right? Um, and this is an important part of that story. Um, and of course, the sort of anchor a text of this presentation is Shell Harris's um, Whiteness is Property Law Review article from 1993. Right? Harris uh, explains property's definition or how we understand that something is property using four metrics. Right? Something is usable, right? I can use the clicker, right? I have possession over it at the moment. Oh, I will give it back to you. Um, <laughs> it confers status, right? If you own something, it gives you some elevated status by, by a condition of owning it. It's exclusionary, right? If I own my home, theoretically, I can stop some random person from entering it. And it's disposable, right? Whereas I can give my property to somebody else, have the ability to give it away. And policing fits all of these definitions. Right? Um, and I think, you know, not just in the case of Jim, but if you think about all these incidents we see on social media and television these days, right? The Central Park bird watching incident, the barbecue Becky or Karen Collar, they're all fitting this dynamic, right? Property owners or, or uh, people who are in these situations use policing like a tool in a tool belt. Um, the ability to do so gives them an elevated status vis-a-vis -vis their counterparts, or in this case, voucher renting keepers. It's of course not available to black residents or to voucher renters. Black residents in general are not uh, as likely to be believed or responded to by police, but voucher renters in specific say that if we call the police, it's more likely that we're gonna get evicted than that we're actually gonna get helped. Right? So they simply don't use it. Right? And finally, it's disposable. And some people conferred their power to, to Jim, who I quoted here, but others in next door groups, right, or the citizen platform or, you know, your local neighborhood watch will sort of give their power over to somebody who's sort of in charge of policing. For them. Uh, and so in all these ways, policing kind of fits this property definition. And I think that goes some way to explaining the rise in the popularity of citizen and ring, next door, whatever next dystopian app comes out. Right, whereby people who ostensibly have anti-racist political commitments nevertheless are on next door as much as someone half their age might be on Um So finally, how are people fighting back? Um, which is probably the most important part of this story. Right? So I'll return to Jesse Smith, who was um, a pastor at a church in the Apple Valley. He says, members kept coming up to me talking about how their homes were being invaded by the LA County Sheriff's Department. And there were literally, it was maybe seven or eight officers showing up at their house because they were on section eight with their guns drawn, knocking on doors, going to their homes, supposedly looking for drugs and looking for ex offenders, right? The two things that would trigger the, um, the one strike eviction rules. Literally, they were stopping their children, asking them, We know your parents are on section eight. You better tell us what gang division you belong to and stuff like that. Smith kind of gets connected to another community group called the Community Action League which have been working on other issues of police brutality, dis disproportionate treatment, um, searches and stops in Mirfield Valley and other, and other policing issues, but they find a lot of common ground. And as Emmett Morell, another member of TCAL describes, TCAL saw themselves as one of the groups that was determined to show that we could compete against these forces that pretty much dominated the culture, but also give people hope for the type of justice we felt had to take place. He says, if we were gonna alter and change that culture, we had to have a vehicle that we could all rally. And poor people needed a good place to stay, right? The housing question became that sort of rally. When it came to the police harassment, the unjust arrests, the two became merged as an equally dangerous issue. Section eight itself became the foil that was gonna determine where we were gonna go and how we were gonna get there. Um, now, earlier I showed you half of this slide that talked about the strengths of this policing system. 
Now I'll say a little bit about the weaknesses of that system, right? Because so many agencies were involved, they kind of relied on each other. They were stronger working together than, they, than any of them were apart. And that meant that if one of these agencies were not, was not particularly committed to the project, they could be sort of a weak link. Um, more agencies being involved meant that, that each of them had more bureaucratic rules to follow or potentially violate and be challenged on. Um, and that tenants had more opportunities to intervene, right? It's not just that you're going to hit a brick wall going to the city council, but you could try the housing authority, you could try the county government, you could try the sheriff's department, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, tenants have more ways then to assert their rights. And so the goal becomes to kind of dismantle this web of policing in the Ethelow Valley. And the strategy is sort of fourfold, right? First, it's about gathering evidence, um, then putting local pressure uh, on, on the community, recruiting legal support that can kind of match the uh, sort of legal framework that's going on on the policing side, and then, and then finally dismantling that policing. So the evidence gathering really um, sort of gathers steam, I suppose, uh, when they're able to organize um, a town hall in the Antelope Valley. And prior to this town hall, it was very hard to kind of spread the word or kind of gather complaints about what was happening. And the local newspapers were basically not taking these tenants seriously. So as one of the lead lawyers in this case explained, uh, Gary Blinken says, it wasn't easy to get individuals to come forward because, well, they were terrorized because the whole point of the policy Right. So having the town hall, having people come forward is a dramatic step in kind of overcoming this atomization and terrorizing this. Farrell Mitchell, who's really one of the most important figures in this, in this story, describes the town hall as saying, well, over 300 people showed up. From there, we told the newspaper, see, it's not just us. It's not just our imagination. You have over 300 people complaining. And from there, the newspaper started taking it seriously. Uh, when I asked uh, Farrell how many People were affected by this policy, said it had to be in the thousands. We were getting calls in our office every day, every day, three and four. People who were even scared had moved out of town were still reaching out to us. Um, after the town hall, they were able to get public attention and put public pressure on these, on these things. Um, and they made the front, the front page of the, of the newspaper. Uh, the mayor's policies were being openly described as racist, right? Um, and they were able to hold press conferences at the Housing Authority that would get public attention and would then unearth more complaints from people who had had these practices happen. The next most important thing is to recruit uh, legal support. So TCAL, being a small, non-legal organization, recruits neighborhood legal services and UCLA's fact investigation clinic to kind of do the evidence gathering work that kind of puts together uh, litigation, right? Um, those two groups are not sort of, don't have the capacity to launch federal civil rights litigation. So they work with an LA group called Public Council that does have the kind of staffing ability to put together this litigation. And Public Council files uh, litigation on their behalf. And soon after they do, the Department of Justice and Civil Rights Division joins in as well. Um, and this is the DOJ's first ever sort of police, uh, policing fair housing case. And finally, TCAL helps to organize some plaintiffs who will serve as the sort of lead plaintiffs or face of the program, right? The, the people who are making the, the headline. Um, as Gary Blasey describes it, our focus was to sort of defang this whole operation, right? And the fang was the sheriff. It's the guy with the gun that makes all this other stuff. There. And that meant we had to set up an information barrier between the housing authority and Lancaster, Pomino, and the sheriff, right? So it's, it's on one hand, defanging the sheriff, but it's also breaking apart this web by creating these barriers between these agencies. The lead plaintiff in the case is Michelle Ross, who uh, makes a public video and becomes a sort of face of news coverage in Los Angeles at this time. Um, and the litigation is called the Community Action League versus the city of Lancaster, it's the Apollo of Los Angeles County. And as I mentioned, the heart of the claim is a really interesting that police practices can violate the Fair Housing Act, which is a relatively new claim that hadn't really been part of the Fair Housing Agenda in the decades beforehand, right? It opens up this sort of avenue of challenging policing using fair housing law that I think um, can be very rich and, and holds a lot of potential. Um, as, soon as, they, as soon as they file this litigation, they begin winning element after element of the case, right? Here you see Catherine Lamont from public council uh, announcing some of these victories and they sort of went as follows. The LA County Board of Supervisors withdrew the funding for the sheriff's involvement, right? So now there's nobody getting, there's no pay, there's no, so no salary coming in. We'll pay for these uh, sheriffs to accompany all of these investigations. 
applications. The Housing Authority of LA County ceases making tenant information available to the cities of Lancaster and Palmdale, which had probably been illegal to have done in the first place. Um, but of course, it's only illegal if it's enforced, right? Yeah. And the cities of Lancaster and Palmdale eventually settled, um, ending their enforcement programs. And a number of other um, pieces come through in this settlement, which is still ongoing and being monitored by the DOJ today. But these victories also come with a, a number of limits that I think are worth mentioning as well. Um, this litigation did end the targeted inspections program, but it left crime free and nuisance ordinances in place, right, which can also lead to evictions and have done so in, in other places around the country. The fact that it was a settlement, in other words, that it didn't go to trial, meant that there's not a legal precedent to rely on for future cases. And while hundreds of people received um, economic compensation or have their housing vouchers restored, many more did not. As Farrell mentioned, many people just moved away out of fear. And they're sort of lost to the ability to kind of uh, repair some of this harm. Um, maybe one other thing to add is that once they went down the litigation route, they were stuck on the timeline of the law, right? And the social movement were kind of waiting to do, you know, take the steps they wanted to take based on when the legal process would unfold. But um, in the years since this case, um, it's been followed by a number of cases that are kind of building on it and filling in those gaps. These cases have happened in Illinois, in Fairbault, Minnesota, Bedford, Ohio, and Antioch, California. And several of them are challenging crime-free and nuisance housing ordinances, it's kind of filling the gap that was left by the Antelope Valley case. Um, and I think I'll sort of leave you with, with a few final thoughts um, to go back to Emma Burrell, who said, you know, he was describing how difficult the, the city made it for the organizers at TCAL. He said, I think the politicians at the time were equally as hard on us as they were on voucher vendors. They were trying to come back what seemed to be a wave of the future, right? And today in the Antelope Valley, there are new sets of campaigns that are challenging um, racist policing practices, particularly in schools. This is a cancel the contract program. Um, and those are building on the work that TCAL had done. And of course, TCAL's work sort of builds on the legacy of the South Antelope Valley and ACP and these other groups. This work, I think, suggests an abolitionist agenda for housing that maybe we can talk about more in the Q&A. Um, but I'm pretty sure my time is up. So let me just say thank you. Um, thank you so much for this amazing talk. I just love the historical breadth of this and the arc of the narrative that you have. And um, actually, the, the question that was simmering for me was so much the abolitionist one, um, because what came up for me seeing some of these happen, some of these um, things come up at the end was um, a question about the degree to which, well, if a policy is on the books and police are still in existence, there's going to be some, some kind of policing that happens. And so to what extent is the resistance to these programs um, trying to discriminate between a good and a bad policing and to what extent is that opposition trying to reformulate what it would mean to live peacefully um, you know because like to have property means that you know it almost seems like an inevitability that you want to protect it somehow and so how do these um, resistances um, think of new ways of protection new ways of community, et cetera. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. So I think um, I think what, what, what really is at the core of what these organizers did that I think makes it legible from an abolitionist framework is that they shrunk the sort of scale or scope of policing of housing in the Valley. Right? There's no longer a, you know, a sort of hotline to call to trigger these hundreds and hundreds of complaints, right? Well, it's still on the books, but basically the complaints went to zero right? after, this, after this litigation, right? Um, even if you make those complaints, those legal settlements basically put this huge clamp on the power of the city or of the, of the housing authority to actually investigate them. Um, you know, they would do this thing where they would come in the middle of the night and knock on the door and kind of say, oh, we think we smell marijuana, right? Which, you know, you can say for you know, any, at any time. And, um, and then they would kind of say, well, you know, we'll be back. You know, we're going to show up at four in the morning tomorrow. Um, all of that stuff is just out of, it's, it's gone now in, in that sense, right? And so 
Um, at the time that I interviewed a number of these organizers, they were thinking and talking about this in sort of a little bit more of a reparations framework, thinking about the, the economic compensation who would have been evicted as maybe a form of reparations or maybe not. And I think they mostly settled kind of on, it's good, but it's not quite reparations, right? Um, but I think, you know, from a little bit more perspective, I think the main goal of sort of shrinking the capacity of policing um, is probably the most lasting. And in some of these other court cases, um, like, in, like in Peoria and a few other, other cities, again, they kind of dramatically shrunk the ability for people to be, be able to essentially um, surveil police and evict, evict their neighbors. I mean, you've had instances where somebody would, you know, dial one of these nuisance hotlines, try to get some evicted. Um, it doesn't happen the next day or the day after, and they email their city council member and say, what's going on? And the city council member forwards the email to the police department and say, can you make sure that these tenants are evicted tomorrow or something, right? Um, a really dystopian amount of power in people's hands that is, that is I think, being chipped away at it very soon um, through, these, through these practices. Um, and I guess sort of one more thing to sort of point out is that there are, I think there are a number of areas that like sort of the intersection of housing justice and, and abolition can focus on, right? So getting rid of the one strike eviction rules, um, it's a lofty goal, but I don't think it's one that's really on the sort of policy radar right now. Um, I'm doing some work trying to study Chicago Housing Authority today. And the Chicago Housing Authority cannot tell you how many people they evict based on these one strike rules, right? They don't even really collect these data in a way that is publicly usable, right? There's no oversight of it because they don't even, they're not even really counting it anymore. Uh, making sort of the Fourth Amendment be meaningful for people in public housing or, or vouchers. Um, there's a law scholar, Alexis Carteron, who's really working on, on trying to make privacy rights meaningful in this sense, right? Um, you know, uh, in, in the context of private housing, you might have had more ability to resist one of these officers at your door, um, but in the public context, you really don't. You really have no ability to say no, right? And of course, there's no, there's no such thing as a castle doctrine if you're on, if you, if you're on the voucher or in public housing. Um, so I think those are some of the areas where um, the two have a sort of fruitful combination. Hi, thanks. Um, all you know, very, very interesting. Also disturbing to learn about. Um, and so, you know, I take it that 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 this work, or at least the the project it's a part of, right, um, has been going on. We've been doing it for quite a while, right? So, so well before uh, the defund the police movement. I mean, maybe not existed, but it was kind of really uh, garnered attention after after George Floyd. And, and I'm kind of interested to know, well, I mean, maybe just a general level, how, how that's changed your thinking, but at more kind of academic, scholarly level, uh, where do you see this aligning? And I guess that's sort of specific point I was thinking about is, is with Ethan the police, you, know, you hear about the, the dramatic increase in, in police department budgets, especially kind of, you know, I mean, after, I guess, kind of September 11th, and then after Afghanistan and Iraq, that all this military equipment kind of, you know, is absorbed by police departments, the kind of rise of the warrior cop. Um, but of course, your narrative, I'm not sure it relies on, on that kind of idea of, of policing or, or budgets, or at least a kind of, um, you know, militarized police force. Um, and of course, it, it just starts further back, right, with, um, uh, you know, pension welfare reform and even back with Reagan. So, yeah, I mean, where, do, you, do you see it aligning or do you think you're telling your kind of parallel narrative or how would it intersect? Um, yeah, yeah, I think um, there are some moments of intersection. Um, in, the, in the early 1990s, the cities of the Inglot Valley um, came up with this thing called Operation Desert Storm for themselves, which was to basically bulldoze vacant properties and kind of crack down on uh, poor families of the Antelope Valley. They had just taken the sort of war mentality that had fallen out, you know, underneath their feet, right? And it was publicized in, you know, the first, the first Gulf War and sort of taken that logic to kind of attack their own communities. Um, but I think more broadly, this is a story of two things happening in Cobo, right? Um, as much as these, these, um, Departments have benefited from you know, nonstop increases in funding and so on. 
I think what's really dangerous about this story is that uh, this police and power is being put into the hands of individuals who have strong individual and collective incentives to use it. Um, I think that's what makes, you know, for example, the city of Chicago has a program where you can essentially get a room camera for free as long as you kind of consent to the CPD being able to access the footage if they would like. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, um, police departments partner with Nextdoor and Ring Cameras and the Citizen app to really create this sort of um, melding or confluence between private actions, right, um, and the sort of private surveillance of one's own property or home and this sort of government access to these, to these powers. And that I think is what, um, is what kind of is a little bit unique about this case is that it, it highlights the, the, the role that individuals play in, in this in, in this practice and and, um, and the sort of collective outcome of that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah, no, no, for sure. I guess as a follow up, I mean, maybe this is not switching from now. This caller maybe did this, and and yeah, also if you're your the last kind of into um, the the application. I guess, I mean, I guess maybe a way to say it is like, you know, also if, if sort of hypothetical defund police activist comes to you, you know, do you think that your work, you know, also has like a yes, but do this too, or don't forget about this, that is maybe not um, as much a part of, uh, you know, the public attention, the activist attention right now? Or, yeah, um, one thing I don't think I really pointed out very clearly is that the Antelope Valley doesn't have its own um, police department. Right? It's, it's what, what's called a charter or contract city. Right? It contracts LA County Sheriff's deputies to run policing there. Right? And so it, it creates this democratic sort of departure whereby people are being policed by officers who have absolutely zero accountability to them. And you know, of course, where the decisions are being made, you know, 75 miles away from them. Right? So, um, yes, to defund and to kind of dealing with this sort of undemocratic nature of this policing system, um, and to um, and so so that, I guess that's one example. Um, the other I think also is that uh, at the same time, the Antelope Valley is is almost always a, in the top two or three cities in the rankings of incarceration spending. So if you go to like milliondollarhoods.org, which calculates neighborhood-based incarceration spending in Los Angeles, um, you'll see that Lancaster and Pompeo are almost always at the top, right? It's not so much about the funding of the police that's occurring, it's about how intensively those police jail and imprison people and how much of public resources are being taken up by that, um, by that activity. Yes. We're still trying to figure out the glitches. <laughs> All I do is just take pictures and send them. Can you talk to that? No observation standby. It's on the map. Now, what happens? <laughs> oh, okay, that's not as well. Well, I was curious about your work in you mentioned that the history of um, Antelope Valley, especially like the Black history of it, is sort of um, been buried a little bit. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uncovering that and also how that translates into the digital exhibit. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Um, there's really like a very interesting and, and very sort of history in the Antelope Valley. Some of you um, might be familiar with uh, the introduction of Mike, uh, Mike Davis's City of Courts, talks about a place called Lano del Rio, which is 10 miles south of, of uh, Sun Village. Called what? Lano del Rio. It was a socialist community built in 1910-ish when the uh, Jacob Harriman, the socialist candidate for mayor of LA, loses the LA mayoralty just like a handful of votes. And they sort of take the movement and build a socialist community in the Antelope Valley in the early 1910s. And um, they're driven out of the Antelope Valley and they move to uh, Louisiana and it's a thriving socialist community until the end of the Great Depression. Um, really interesting uh, story. Um, but that's one example right, of sort of 
community building outside of um, racial segregation and sort of capital scarcity, the Anvil Valley. Then you have the Sun Village story, of course, and you have also uh, a population of Japanese farmers who had moved to the Anvil Valley in the, in the 1920s and 30s, and who had created some of the farming techniques that were being advertised to sort of make the desert bloom, I guess you could say. Right? Um, they, of course, were dispossessed of their farms and their lands uh, in the early 1940s during World War II and sent, uh, you know, of course, into incarceration um, in, in the Costone uh, camp in Arizona. Um, but you can sort of see that there were many different possibilities at play here that, and, and a much more varied uh, form of what life could have been like in the Antelope Valley that kind of gets squashed out by um, this insistence on a sort of military development trajectory and one that goes hand in hand with British service and sort of white supremacy. Um, and in fact, um, you know, much of the sort of public history of the Antelope Valley kind of organizes itself around that as well. Um, and what's interesting about it is that the reality is sort of sitting in plain sight, right? Some villages are, of course, still there. The main community institutions that were built, the churches are still standing. Um, Jackie Robinson Park, which is the first public park in the country named in honor of Jackie Robinson before uh, Harlem's famous Jackie Robinson Park and before the city of Pasadena where he grew up even recognized him. That park is still um, a very important place in the Antelope Valley. It was a hub for uh, COVID relief distribution, um, surveys and other kinds of community building work. Um, so all that is, is there. It's, it's sort of a question of what story does the Antelope Valley want to tell about itself, I think. And um, I think the story of this was a white place that, and its decline is, has gone hand in hand with this diversification is a very easy story to tell that kind of allows the blame for its economic decline to be placed upon its, you know, uh, demographic change. Right? And of course, that sort of doesn't make any sense once you once you wind back the clock a little bit more. Um, and I think that hopefully would push people to think about how to how to make a different future in the Valley today that's not so dependent on um, on segregation and scarcity. I should also add, actually, one more thing that, that it also has a very long. Uh, indigenous presence and, and history as well. And that history has sort of been, um, I don't know how to put it, but like extraordinarily disrespected by um, a sort of amateur anthropologist and collector who kind of went across the Antelope Valley picking up things and creating a, a museum of sorts, whereby he made up these comical representations of people who lived in the Antelope Valley. Um, and that place is still, it's still extant today, it's still there. Um, and again, it's part of the sort of myth-making about who really has a right to the Antelope Valley and who doesn't. Um, I wanted, I sort of realized that I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, um, the policing as property claim and, and, um, and why it's important to you. Um, so the, so it, it, the idea is that uh, policing or the power to police behaves as property. It's got the, the sort of four marks that you go as, as property. How can you just, and the last one is it's disposable. How can you, how do you dispose of it, the power to police? I mean, people, so, because I was thinking you don't need, I mean, you don't need to be a property owner to have that power or even to sort of live in the neighborhood. Presume. So I'm thinking, I mean, not that that matters for the overall project, but how can you dispose of it? And then if it doesn't sort of line up with the kind of features of property, does that make any difference to you? So what's important about that claim for you? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, I, I think I've tried to gloss over some of this a little bit yeah. to kind of fit everything in. And um, um, but, but let me say two things. First, that um, even in that, in that, in that law review article, um, and much more so today, um, Shell Harris and others kind of diminish the role of disposability, right? So like um, as a marker of property, right? So if I have like a credential, um, you know, okay, I have a diploma from UIC, I can't dispose of it, but it still bears many of the characteristics of property in terms of status and, you know, and being a souvenir and so on. Right? But more importantly, what I mean here as policing kind of fits this disposability characteristic is that, um, I talked to a number of people sort of like Jim, but Jim was the most extreme people I talked to, but they would say things like, oh, I know how to do this, but I just, I just let somebody else know, and they're the ones who makes the call. They're the one who makes the call, right? They're the sort of neighborhood watch captain, if you will. In other words, they're saying, I'm giving my power to police over to somebody else who I'm entrusting to do the work of policing. Right? To me, that's kind of where the disposability sort of logic happens. 
put us in the air. Does that, does that help? It does, yeah. yeah. And, and the reason I sort of anchor this around property in, in this sort of sense, this sort of non-real property sort of sense of it is that I think it helps explain um, the real like symbolic or social status attachments that people have towards engaging in policing. I mean, you, you probably noticed in this mural election that um, the only problem the city has ever had or will ever have is it, regardless of where the line goes, this is the singular obsession of so many people in the media, right? Um, and I think part of that obsession is rooted in the symbolic benefits to people of obsessing over and trying to regulate crime in their own everyday capacities to do so. And I think that's part of what makes it so hard to deal with, to deal with these, these issues because people have attachments that go beyond the actual facts or realities of the question and into their own sort of um, social status or sense of self through police. Yeah, just, I mean, you, you started with sort of the, you know, that this has kind of come to fruition in, in this particular way, but it's never a, a period, right? It's always a <laughs> cyclical process. And so I'm just curious about how, what the resistance is to the resistance and how that sort of maybe come out. Yeah, um, there's this uh, sort of depressing quote I didn't share from Gary Dirksy, who's one of the, one of the main litigants who says, you know, he talks about some of the other litigation work he does. Um, around homelessness and homelessness enforcement in Los Angeles, right? Where uh, the police department says, well, you know, when these legal activists win something, right? They, they've won a few injunctions against the city of LA um, in terms of like, throwing away people's property, like, you know, when they're doing encampment sweeps and so on, which is a trend that's beginning to happen in Chicago as well. But the police department says, oh, it's no problem. There's a million other ways that we can accomplish the same thing. The law gives us such extraordinarily wide powers that we can you know, you shut the window, we'll go through the door, right? Um, and so I think that's part of the sort of resistance to resistance is to just find new ways to kind of work around these systems. Um, I forget the name of the, of the, the city, I believe it's San Bernardino, but they actually did an app whereby you can go on the city created app and complain about uh, when you see a homeless person, houseless person in, in the neighborhood, right? That the city would then dispatch something, right? So I think, um, you know, I think that digital frontier is maybe the next step. Much of this happened, some of it actually happened on Facebook, but much of it happened before the rise of these apps. And I, I think those apps are really the next turn in this story. Thank you so much for joining us.